My name is Dr. Grace Telesco. My name is Dr. Grace Telesco. My name is Dr. Grace Telesco. I'm joined by Dr. Teresa Lily White, Dr. Lenore Walker, uh, Mr. Ed Denzel. Investigation with Dr. T is uh, something that actually was the brainchild of our dean, Dr. Durham. And now, coming up this next season, we're going to be doing it almost weekly, a weekly show on a Thursday night. So um, lots of really cool guests. Not, it's not just police topics. It's not just corrections topics, but it's topics that, that are affecting us in, in kind of all areas. But one of the things that we hope uh, to get across is raising, the, raising awareness, educating about some of these really important topics, topics like human trafficking, topics like um, disasters. We did a show, Confessions of a Serial Killer. So for this upcoming season, we've got a couple of really cool things. We're gonna have um, in the, the, a day in the life of a DEA agent. Another really cool one, which is really close to my heart, is gonna be on September 11th. Because not only do we wanna talk about 9-11 and the work of the NYPD, but I also wanna really look at the mental health outcomes. You know, We also have the human trafficking panel. We are gonna bring back our Brevard Sheriff, uh, Sheriff Wayne Ivey. It's always a pleasure to have him on. We're gonna have Unfound again, Ed Denzel. He'll, he'll be coming back uh, a few times. And uh, that's gonna be really exciting and interesting too. Welcome everybody, uh, Dr. Grace Telesco, uh, and we're joined with a few other attendees I see. Thank God for that. Uh, there was a little bit of a snafu with the webinar link, so I do apologize for those who are actually going to be watching this uh, on the rerun. <laughs> Nobody says that anymore. I show my age when I say that, but anyway, uh, you know, watch it on the recording uh, on YouTube. However, um, I am so excited outside of that little snafu with the with the webinar link being the incorrect link. Um, we are so grateful that we have with us tonight, Dr. Adrian Brundorge, and I'm going to read uh, a little bit of her bio. I'm going to ask her to come on now, share her uh, her camera. And there she is. That's Hi, Dr. Everybody. Adrian Brundarge, and she is a board certified forensic entomologist and lecturer of entomology and forensics. She received her PhD in entomology from Texas A&M. She's worked as a forensic entomologist across North America since 1999. She's consulted with local law enforcement agencies, the FBI, NCIS, and the ASPCA and private entities on cases of abuse, neglect, and death. In addition to these consultations, Dr. Brundarge teaches entomology and forensics at both Texas A&M and University of Florida. She's taught uh, various entomological and forensic courses at San, San Jose State University, Baylor, and Blinn College. She's a prolific public speaker, giving talks and leading training seminars for all ages in forensic entomology across the country. Uh, of course, her, her um, bio goes on and on, and um, I would... Highly recommend that you Google her. Uh, just put in Dr. Adrian Brundarge, Texas A&M, and her bio will come up and you will see it. Now, here's why we're so blessed, because we had to wait an entire year for this. So <laughs> there was a problem with the, I don't even know what happened. There might be some kind of like, I don't know what. It was aliens. Like, it was <laughs> something. We had a massive weather issue and all the power around town went out. Everything was down. It was Mercury just... was in retrograde. I don't know. Yeah, something happened. I don't know. But the whole thing was a crime scene. And it was, uh, it, was it was pretty bad because um, right as we were like waiting for Dr. Brundarge to come on, we were like texting her, emailing her. And um, I think the so the power was out and you weren't able to actually. Yeah, I was trying us. to find places. It was a whole. It was exactly. A That's right. And then I had a tap dance and I don't remember what I tap danced with, but I <laughs> but I tap dance because here we are live and I had to say something and I had to do something. And I don't think anybody I don't think anybody was interested at all in hearing oh, me no. sing uh, or play the piano, which I can do both. But. I can't remember what we did and 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 it might have been it might have been uh Nicholas Cruz sentencing <laughs> or Layla do you remember 
I do. I uh, we talked about um, the case with the people going to Mexico. And uh, what happened in Mexico. Right. So yes. I, I, while this is all going on, I'm, I'm texting our production yeah. team and I'm saying, what should we, what do I, we do? what do I do? <laughs> what should I talk about? And, uh, and one of them said, uh, why don't you talk about the, 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 the hostages that were taken and killed in Mexico that happened like right around that time. Perfect. Um, so that's what I tap danced on. And I remember uh, driving but, around McDonald's trying to find anybody with Wi-Fi and my uh, like my iPad in my car. It was oh my god, it was hurricane season, I believe. So that was probably a massive hurricane hit. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, <laughs> I'm love sorry it. that that happened, but um, I'm so grateful that we have you now. Thank you. And um, so you're a bug lady. Yes, you're a bug lady. <laughs> like, what's up with that? Like nobody likes oh. bugs. Bugs How are you the become, best. What are you talking about? Bugs are the oh, best. man. They are. I know exterminators think that, but um, well, how did you get involved in this? And how did you get, how were you fascinated by it? What are the, you know, what was your background? All of that. Tell us, well, tell us a little bit about it. I tell the story a lot. My mom loves this story. Uh, I came home from preschool one day and I just announced to the household, to my mom, I'm going to be an entomologist when I grow up. And um, she went, well, what, what is that? And I said, I get to play with bugs for the rest of my life. So I'm convinced it was some amazing preschool teacher who saw me outside collecting roly polies or whatever it was I was doing every single recess and told me a new world. And uh, that word gave me uh, this new path in life. Like, I didn't know you could do that. This is amazing. And my mind has been made up since I was really little. I've always just been fascinated by this world of insects and creepy crawlies and various things. Uh, you know, I was never, never the kid who would scream at spiders. I remember vividly bringing in sacks of spider eggs to show my mom. She loved it. She's like, great. Thank you. Or I would make uh, these big terrariums out of jars and such for uh, roly polies. And what they eat, they're, they're decomposers. So they eat dog poop, I learned. And so I just had this whole series of jars with different food in them to see what would work. And so my mom came in one day and just found a bunch of jars full of the old dog poop and roly polies. And she's trying very hard not to squash my enthusiasm, but also please don't keep those in your room anymore. <laughs> or when my dad wanted me, um, you know, he would he, he bought me my first little purse when I was six. And then I went outside immediately and ran experiments on ladybugs with it. So I would put ladybugs in there and spin them around and then see if they would fly. And I think it was after that, they just sort of gave up with anything other than insects. And it's just such this world of uh, bugs is this unknown, fascinating thing. They're in every niche on earth. They're in every possible area. They've been around well before we were even and on the horizon, they'll be here well after we're gone and just the evolution and their behavior and the types of things that they can handle and do incredible. And just recently, oh, this is this rippled through the entomology world recently. And in the department at AM, people were just stopping by offices and getting all excited. There's a beetle that uh somebody just just uh, wrote a paper about called a rove beetle and it has grown this growth on its abdomen like a cancerous growth that mimics the look of a termite and so it has this termite growth on its back and it just invades termite mounds and pretends it's a termite and the other termites will feed it just <laughs> it's incredible so that that's we spent hours giggling about that and telling each other and it was very exciting so and that is uh sort of what we're into <laughs> over here and so this is and this is a beetle so yeah, not, not, not Ringo or, or Paul or George. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. One of the, it's the fifth beetle that you hear a lot about. Fifth beetle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is funny. When you were, when you were young, did you play with creepy crawlers? The, this, like it, it was, I don't know. It was like a stove or a, like an oven that you would like make different yes. bugs, you know, bug, bug molds and whatnot. I used well, that to play came with out that. Yeah, that came out when I was in college. And so I um, probably distressed all my roommates. I used to do that every day for hours and hours. And it was like little, it was goop. And you would put it, it was like an easy bake oven with exactly. these little molds. Yes. And you could put the, this plasticky stuff in it and bake it. And then they would stick to windows. Yes. I had thousands of these things all over my dorm. Awesome. Awesome. And I would just be watching TV, making these things for 
hours and hours and hours every single day. And I'd be at Toys R Us once a week trying to buy the new ones. It was an epidemic in crazy, that household. Crazy. <laughs> well, in my house, we don't like bugs. So oh. we we have an exterminator come pretty regularly to make sure that they don't come in the house. But um, I know that there's a lot of our students that are on. We have a, a, a few viewers now on YouTube. We have some in this uh, webinar now. And, you know, a lot of people will watch this later on, you know, on YouTube. And so a lot of our CJ students, you know, they're they're fascinated by forensics. Some of them are interested in, in becoming forensic, either forensic scientists or um, whatever it might be, technicians, you know, whatever it might be in uh, in the criminal mm -hmm. justice arena. So why don't you just, without any further ado, tell us what in God's name is forensic entomology. And uh, I hope that you like the title, Murder, Maggots, and Perfect. Wolves. So I'm just going to give it to you now. I'm going to spotlight okay. you and um, you can share your screen with us because I know you have some cool things for us to look at. Yeah. So hopefully everybody can see my uh, screen now. But again, my name is Adrian Brundage. I'm a board certified forensic entomologist. And what that means is that I study how insects and the legal system interact. That's just your basic definition. Uh, whenever you have insects and any type of lawsuit or any type of crime or anything of that nature, that's where forensic entomology comes in. So I try to use this expertise on uh, forensic entomology to tell investigators or lawyers or participants in the law, as you could call it, uh, what I can on that. Now, what it means to be a board certified forensic entomologist is uh, the American Board of Forensic Entomology. It's a group of scientists who've been doing this since you know the 70s, the 80s. And it got to a point where we were uh, having entomologists come into the courtroom on a semi-regular basis, but there was no standardization or anything of that nature. So they created it. So in order to become board certified, I had to work, uh, or I had to first get my PhD, then I had to work under uh, a forensic entomologist as an intern, basically. I then had to be the lead on a few cases, uh, send those into the board along with my application, showing my education. I had to have a PhD in entomology. And then I had to sit for a, an exam and just to test that I knew what I was talking about. And so the exam took 12 hours and I took two the last second and it was um, awful and amazing at the same time. And then every five years I have to recertify. So I have to show that I'm up on the research, that I uh, am aware of the latest things that are coming out, that I'm doing my own research, that I'm doing casework actively, going to trainings, that sort of thing, just to make sure that I know what I'm talking about on a regular basis. So uh, as a consultant, I work as a private consultant. People can call me from all walks of life. I just recently got called into Brazil. I just worked a case in Italy. When I say worked a case, they emailed me stuff. I didn't get to go, which is too bad. But uh, they people will send me information or they'll send me uh, insects, evidence, that sort of thing. And I will tell them what I can about that particular case. Now, when we talk about forensic entomology, it's most broad is that interaction between arthropod science and the law. So I deal with bugs. There is a specific definition of an insect, but really when it comes down to it, anything that has more than four legs that isn't furry is usually what I get called in on. So Insects are technically things with head, thorax, abdomen, six legs, you know, but if there are spiders, millipedes, centipedes, anything that is considered not a mammal, pretty much, I will get uh, called in on. And a lot of times I, I can tell at least something. Uh, entomology is vast. It is incredibly diverse. There are more beetles than anything else on earth. Uh, I mean, there's more arthropods in general than any other uh, recognized species out there. And most of those are beetles. So trying to know everything about entomology is not a thing that happens. So we tend to break it up into larger groups. Right now, uh, we tend to specialize in certain areas of entomology, although with PhD, you tend to know some about everything. So this first is urban entomology. This tends to uh, have to do with insects in the human environment. So I get called in on urban cases if there is oh, infestation of insects in a building. 
for some reason. One of the urban cases I worked a few years back was, um, it was during the pandemic, uh, uh, a junior high put in a new building and it was infested with these little uh, mites or little uh, um, gnats. And um, the builders were saying it was the janitors or the weather was causing this. And so they called me in to see where this was coming from and who needed to fix it. And it turned out that when the uh, contractors backfilled underneath that building, they brought in non-native soil and it was soil from back east somewhere. I'm in Texas. And it was infested with these little gnats. So it wasn't a native species. It was just feeding off the stuff in the soil. The soil they brought in hadn't been sterilized or treated. And so they had to take that all out. So that's basically urban entomology. Whenever there's insects in the human environment, they become a problem. Stored products is insects found in food. So this is if you're out eating at a restaurant and there's a bug in your food, you want a refund or you want to sue or whatever it is recently worked a, a case at a fast food joint that had rice and beans and there were maggots in the rice and beans. The fast food joint said that there was no way that the maggots could have um, survived. So it must have been the person who uh, bought the stuff. And uh, so I got a DoorDash, a bunch of this food, much to my intern chagrin. And we put maggots in it to see if they would survive. And they did just fine. And it turns out that food fast food place had a broken fridge and they were storing this food in this broken fridge is why. And then the one that everybody seems to know about is medical criminal entomology. This is usually criminal cases. So this is where we use flies as they show up on dead bodies or dead animals or on blood or things of that nature. This is the one that everybody knows from if you're uh, older like me, the old CSI episodes, they had some entomologists. Uh, before CSI came out, it was Silence of the Lambs. They had some entomologists from the Smithsonian that sort of thing. It's just insects on or in bodies. Uh, and so I've put together for you a series of cases. One is just sort of a basic case and then some unusual cases that I looked at. So there are some body photos, so please be warned. Uh, but if you have any questions, feel free to stop me and ask. And I can talk about this all day. So if you just let me go, I'm going to go forever. But medical criminal entomology is the use of insects to help solve these crimes. Basically, what we do is we look at the natural tendency of insects to show up on decomposing material. They're the reason that we're not knee deep in rotten dead things, all these decomposers out there. And flies can show up within seconds or minutes after death. Uh, and they show up in a certain order and last a certain amount of time, depending on time of year, temperature and location of the body. Because they react so much to temperature, Oh, I can actually calculate around how old they are in hours, days, weeks, something like that, based on their developmental stage. So now that I know about all that, if I have the right research done, I can do a quick calculation and give investigators a time frame where I say this body was available for colonization between your know, last Friday and Sunday or something of that nature. The longer it's been, the bigger that time frame is going to be, but it really helps narrow down where um, the investigators can start looking, looking for alibis and suspects and that sort of thing. So an example of this, uh, this is a case that I worked um, several years back. Uh, this is probably one of the more common uh, cases that I get called in on. I get called in on those cases after the body is through that fresh stage. They're really, really stinky and decomposed. That's when the flies and the other insects are most um, active. And so I get called in then, but it's before they're fully skeletonized. So I get to deal with that smell. But in this particular case, uh, a woman has a, a bunch of land and she's sort of on this back road home from the bars. So she often gets people pulling over in her uh, back 40 in order to sleep it off, I guess, after a night out. And one morning she was leaving for work, noticed a car in one of her fields. That's not unusual. What was unusual is when she came back and the car was still there. Usually they're gone after she gets back from work. So she went to check it out and she found this guy in uh, the car and he was uh, pretty dead. He's here in the passenger seat. Uh, you can see right here, he is leaning back. You can see he's in this advanced state of decay. Here he is right before autopsy. And um, 
they, when they got there, they opened up all the doors, tried to figure out how long he'd been dead. But because he has gone through rigor, you know, body temperature is equalized, all the normal things that medical examiners can do, they have to look at the stage of decomp. They wanted to know if there's anything I could tell them because there were so many flies in the car. Now, uh, I went a couple of days after he was found. So they saved autopsy so I could go and see it. the autopsy. All these little things here are maggots. And this is the back of the car at impound. Uh, this is a several inches of dead adult flies in the back window of the car. And then sitting on top of these uh, flies, there was a dead dragonfly and a dead moth right there. When I opened up the door, this is the uh, runner on the driver's side. So it's cut off in this uh, picture here. But these are all pupae of those flies. So I was trying to figure out how old these flies were based on our very basic understanding of this or to simplify it. Uh, when this guy died, provided the flies could get there, they would have shown up very, very quickly after he died, laid their eggs on that body. Those eggs would have gone uh, hatched, gone through the maggot stage, and then eventually left the body, pupated and turned into adults. When they're pupae, they go to places to hide. So they went and hid underneath the door. They went into the trunk. This is a picture of the trunk. You can see a bunch of pupae and pupil casings that have emerged there. And then they emerged in the car, became adults, and just sort of died in the back window. If you've ever had a, a fly lost in your house or trapped in your house, they just hit the window until they die or somebody lets them out. The big question that I had was when the body was found, were the windows open or closed? This is because I want to know, was there any delay in the flies getting to that body? If the windows are closed and it's an airtight car, uh, the flies can smell it and be on the outside, but they're not going to lay their eggs. If they were open, then they, they'll get in there really, really fast. But that is going to change my time of colonization estimation. If I assume that they had full access to the body, however old these uh, pupae or these maggots are when the body was found, can equate to how long the body was out there and available for co uh, colonization. So if the body died there, then that equals time of death. That's for the investigator to decide. If, however, well, we had to wait or the windows were all closed, then we have to assume that these maggots aren't equal or even close to that time of death because we don't know how long the body was there beforehand. So the question I had to ask was the body actually available for colonization for these flies to get into. And nobody really knew. I didn't have any photos of the car uh, before investigators had found it, before the woman had gone and opened the door to see what was happening. They couldn't even tell me. You can see the sunroof is open here. They couldn't tell me that. So I had to go with other insects or other information. And that's where uh, this dragonfly and this moth came into uh, play in this case is uh, a dragonfly can't get in really small places. And dragonflies are pretty... Uh, skittish. If there are people around, if there's a bunch of investigators around, they're not going to come flying into a car. So this dragonfly being in the car told me that it had to have access and it had to have access before this scene was disturbed. Same thing with the moth. Moths are a little less skittish, but they're still really big. So if a moth and a dragonfly can get in and then they take longer to die than these flies do, if they can get in, then it's, I can assume that the flies had full access to the body as soon as this guy died. So then I was able to take this information and the stages that I saw, here are some maggots that I caught from the body. Here are some flies as they were emerging from these pupil casings when I was at impound. I could use that information and give a time of colonization estimation. So this car had been there for about two, two and a half weeks by the time the woman noticed it. Uh, you know, investigators asked her, do you normally just not look back there? She says, sometimes I notice it, sometimes I don't. She doesn't on a regular basis go out there. So she honestly did not know how long that car had been there. So this time of colonization helped them narrow down when this guy died. And it turned out he uh, was with a friend. The friend shot him uh, in this car, just left the car in the body and took off on foot. And it was right around that time. I think it was about two and a half weeks before the body was found. So this is our basic idea of forensic entomology. Insects show up. We're able to age them. 
based on a pretty simple calculation, as long as we know the species and the ambient temperature, and we can give that time a colonization estimation. Now, these next few cases um, are a little bit of a departure on these things. This one's a bit of a brutal case. Uh, this happened back in 2018. This was a case of a woman who, uh, an elderly female who was uh, found dead during a welfare check. In this case, uh, she was working, I, it was at a drugstore, I think, and she hadn't shown up to work for a week, which was unusual. Her coworkers called and uh, stated that they hadn't seen her, sent the cops for a welfare check. They found her body during this welfare check. She'd been dead five days. She was in this air-conditioned home. Uh, the According to the case file, at least the photos, it looked like the back door was wide open, but the interesting thing was that there were no flies on the body. There were no maggots on the body. That is unusual. This happened in September, so it's a time of year when there should have been flies. There are flies everywhere. They're very active. If the back door was open, they should have had just straight access to them, even with an air conditioner on. Uh, and um, she was there for long enough that there should have been maggots on them. I didn't get called in on this case by the investigators because they had an accurate time of death. She was wearing a Fitbit at the time and they were able to subpoena the Fitbit information and find the moment that her heart rate spiked from being attacked and then when she flatlined. They also had ring cameras. You know, everybody has those ring doorbells nowadays. And so they were able to watch the perpetrator show up and go in and then he was sitting in his driveway in his car when her heart stopped. So it was pretty much a cut and dried case, but I got called in by a private investigator hired by the family of the suspect because uh, the suspect was her 94 year old stepfather. And uh, the ring cameras show that he showed up. He, uh, in his statement, he stated that he was bringing her pizza that he and, and her mom had made. Uh, he did that on a regular basis as he was leaving was when her heart stopped and he sat in the driveway for a little bit and uh, texted or something and then drove away. So it was pretty cut and dried uh, with that, but the family insisted it wasn't him. So what they were trying to do was figure out if there was somebody else in that house. Uh, when they contacted me, uh, I said, well, I can look into why there were no maggots on the body. There should have been. Why wouldn't there be? So I had to go through a whole bunch of information on that. Now, these photos are a little shocking, but um, in this case, uh, here's the, the woman. You can see that the pizza that her stepdad brought her is right there. She's actually holding a knife because she was cutting the pizza. Uh, she is, you know, there's blood everywhere. There's blood on the floor that was dried out, blood on the table. She was killed with a hatchet. Uh, they never found that weapon. And it looks like she wasn't moved. All the lividity was um, correct. You know, she wasn't moved from this space. Uh, and here's a picture of the back door as I received it. So that door was open. There was no reason why there shouldn't have been flies on, the, on that body. So I looked into any possible reason as to why there wouldn't have been. Uh, I looked into the city to see if there was any you know, pest control happening, any sprays happening. There hadn't been. The place where she lived was down the street from a park that used biocontrol. So nothing that they had done on record, at least, would have killed the flies. She was an avid gardener, but she only used safer soap and other um, really non-toxic physical barriers for insects. So I had the investigator take a bunch of photos of the backyard for me and she had a bunch of pests on, on her plants. So it wasn't like she was overly spraying her backyard and killing everything. So that was unusual. It really just came down to, I didn't think that the door was open when the investigators got there. The only thing that made sense was the door was opened after the fact or the door was opened well after she was dead and the flies hadn't had a chance to come in and lay their eggs yet. Uh, that could either be the investigators got there and forgot uh, because they were doing a welfare check. They probably looked in the windows, were able to go in because they, they had this probable cause they could see her and they just didn't note that the door was shut or uh, they just forgot to uh, mention it or, which is what I think the family was hoping for, 
was that there was somebody else in that house when the stepdad came. And then when they left, they left the door open. So they were trying to uh, prove his innocence. I have nothing to do with that. My job is to figure this out. And so my final conclusion was the door was not open this entire time in an air conditioned home. It was a pretty efficient house. There was really no way for the flies to get in. So what I could really tell was, you know, exactly when she died, but the flies were there because there was no, weren't there because there was no access. That's all I can really tell you. Turned out the, uh, his, the dad did it. Um, when they arrested him, he had a, a hearing aid and he turned it off and just talked to himself in the interrogation room and basically just admitted to everything without knowing he was speaking out loud. So that was that, but fascinating that there were no bugs on this at all. Uh, this case, this is uh, usually what I state as one of my most interesting cases. This happened way back in 2013, so I guess 10 years ago now. In this case, it was a 26-year-old disabled man. He uh, had severe epilepsy, and um, he had to be in long-term care. He's being cared for by his mom at home. He couldn't take care of himself, couldn't clean himself, couldn't use the, the bathroom on his own, nothing. So his mom was his full-time caretaker. Uh, the mom called 911 at around 8 a.m. Uh, one morning saying that she found her son. He was deceased on his bed and she didn't know what happened. EMTs got there and they contacted the police because of these unusual circumstances. There were weird flies all over his body, but they weren't the normal flies that we normally see on decomposing material. They weren't the blow flies or the Californy. They were a Drosophila, a fruit fly type of species called Drosophila buskii. What they were asking me was, is there evidence of neglect in this case? So where this case happened, if a, um, a death happens as a result of neglect and that neglect was to somebody who couldn't take care of themselves, so a very young child, somebody elderly, a disabled adult, then there is an extra sentence or extra time can be served to those caretakers because of that neglect. So my job was to determine if there was a way we could see how long he had been neglected, if he'd been neglected at all. So this is what the scene looked like. Here he is where he was found. And it's these flies as to why the EMTs called police. So he was just covered in these tiny little fruit flies. Imagine if you have a fruit fly outbreak in your kitchen, you know, you let some peaches rot or something on your um, counter and you have just thousands of these fruit flies. That's what it was like in here it was just crowds of these things landing on this body. And so they thought that was really, really strange. When they found him, he was sort of wrapped in this blanket on his bed. He didn't have any uh, sheets or blankets on the bed. He did not have pants on at this case. He was wearing a shirt and he had his bonnet in. He had just, uh, well, he'd had his hair washed. It was still wet and he was in rigor. And it looked like from the way he was sitting, you can see from this photo here, his legs were bent. And it looked like he was sitting in a chair, but there was no chair in the room. This is a picture of the ground around the bed. It's just covered in sort of blankets. And these are bath mats from the restroom nearby. And when they moved it, there was this massive stain that was fecal material and urine. Um, eventually, they found a chair. The chair looked like this when they removed all these pads uh, this chair fit these four indentations on the ground, and there's a stain on the wall that was hair oil. So that's where his head was sitting. There was this crusty stuff all over the chair that was fecal material. And then in the trash can out front, they found uh, a jacket that was covered in fecal material, a bunch of the maggots of these flies, a bunch of pupae. They found soiled underwear, soiled adult diapers. They found the mom's... Um, nightgown that was still wet from uh, some sort of washing. And they found this cut up uh, extension cord. What ended up happening was because he couldn't take care of himself, mom was on her own in this. She used to tie him to this chair every day and turn on the TV. So he would sit in the corner up over here and right across the bed was a TV. She would just turn on the TV for him and he would sit in this chair tied to the chair. If he wasn't tied to the chair, he would apparently get up and walk outside and go into dangerous situations. So she kept him there. He was severely epileptic and he had some severe brain damage. 
uh, his epilepsy medicine hadn't been administered for a long time. Uh, so there was no evidence of that in his system. And uh, she forgot about him one night, apparently. He vomited and aspirated that vomit and died sitting up. She found him in the middle of the night and called um, for help, but she didn't call the police or EMT. She called family members who came and sort of cleaned everything up. His hair was wet because they washed him before they called the EMTs, threw away all the soiled bedding and everything, and uh, just then called the EMTs after about five hours of cleanup. So I was looking at these pupae that were on the chair here. I was looking at the maggots, the pupae, and some of the adults. And this was an unusual fly. Uh, this particular fly I learned took me a long time to find out what it was, but this particular fly shows up on fecal material, but also things like uh, rotten potatoes of all things. So this is a close up of the fly. The, this is one of the pupil casing. It's, it's in the usual pupae. So that made it a little bit easier to ID. He had this very extensive diaper rash on his buttocks. Here's the fly here. And here's a picture of the underwear. Uh, so I was looking at the age of these maggots and the, the pupae to determine how long it had been since he'd been uh, changed out of the diaper. So I pulled the ones from his underwear here. I pulled uh, some examples from the carpet and from the chair itself. And I was very lucky in this uh, regard. This particular fly was one that uh, when entomologists and scientists were looking at a model organism for DNA back in the 60s and 70s, this was one of the candidates. They eventually went with a different Drosophila species, but they had looked at this one enough that I knew how uh, long it would take them to rear and to grow. So I was able to take that information and calculate how long it would take them to get to the maggot and the pupil stage in this man's underwear. Uh, and that would give me a a uh, sort of general idea of how long it had been since they had been changed. Now, uh, I went as conservative as I possibly could on this one, simply because it was, it was this idea that if I show neglect and I'm wrong, then the, the, pers the caretaker will get an automatic 20 or so extra years on whatever sentence she had. Uh, and so I did not want to be overly zealous on this, especially since this is a fly that hasn't been used a lot. So I was very cognizant of that and had to be very careful in what I said. Uh, and so the warmer it is, the faster they're going to grow. So the older they're going to be. So I used body temperature since they were in his underwear. Like, okay, they're probably experiencing body temperature. But even if they were experiencing body temperature, growing the fastest they possibly could, it would take them almost three weeks to get to this stage. And they were there were some slightly older ones in his underwear. So he was wearing the, that same pair of underwear fouled with uh, fecal material for nearly three weeks at a minimum. And uh, so that is uh, that was some pretty nasty evidence to have to explain, but that was that helped the state prove this case of neglect along with a bunch of other things. So they ended up uh, pleading out, I believe, on this one. So this was an abuse case and these flies show up on the fecal material in general. So, Dr. Brundorge, I'm yeah. just going to um, I'm just going to stop a second here, if sure. you don't mind. Um, and I'm just uh, I'm just trying to see how I can get my. Where where am I anyways? <laughs> <laughs> where am I? OK, you nobody can't knows see me. I'm going to just remove the spotlight a second. OK, there we are. We both are there now. Excellent. Um, so. The first thing that I want to say to the audience is I've been putting up some warnings that the yes. program has some graphic imagery, which may be very disturbing. Plus, besides the imagery that's disturbing, the, um, you know, the content is disturbing also to yeah. hear that to hear that someone who's supposed to be taking care of and, and, and is has that custodial obligation is yeah. doing this. You said uh that that they took a plea mm -hmm. do you know you know anything further on the case as as far as who was charged and um in, how much time did they serve or what what was their punishment so in this mm -hmm. case it was the mom was charged here um because she was the main caretaker 
and um her they were asking i believe for i think it was 30 years for this death because of the neglect beforehand uh they pled out for less than that i don't know the exact number but this is one that went to trial which is honestly unusual so i went and testified in this trial um and yeah, I don't remember, I don't know exactly how long it was, but it was this evidence uh, with the flies that was the crux of their neglect case, along with the um, the medication that hadn't been refilled or administered. Yeah. And so and, and those how, two long ago, how long ago, how long ago was this case? 10 years, 10 years ten, ago, 10 years. So yeah. is it possible that they're that the mother is still incarcerated or? I mean, yeah, very well could be very okay. well could be. Yeah, and it's then, one of those things I don't usually get follow ups on a lot of these and I don't even really know uh, the perpetrator or suspect or anything unless I really go to court and I do that on purpose. Um, this is one of those cases that helped me determine how to try to be as unbiased as possible. This is the type of thing that is so upsetting and yes. really awful. Yes. Uh, and then I was, you know, talking to my mom about it as everybody I think does like call your mom when there's something you need to get off your chest. And she was so upset on behalf of um, this man's mom. She was just, I can't, I can't imagine what it's like to have to care for somebody like this or how stressful that must have been and all the work she was doing and all this sort of stuff. And I realized that I couldn't think like that when looking at this type of evidence. I couldn't mm -hmm. bring into my thought process. Yeah, you know what? It is hard. Uh, she had no help. I have no idea what her financial situation was or the insurance or any of the stuff. And so, because it's so easy to want to go easy on it, honestly, like, I mean, I could have said, oh no, this happens overnight. And there's nobody out there that would have been able to tell any different because yeah. um, there's not many of us. And so right. I had to wrestle with how am I going to make sure that I'm not letting my personal feelings come into this? And I have to make sure that I'm not over, um, like getting so angry at the uh, suspect or so angry at this caretaker. Like you left this man in his underwear. He couldn't take care of himself. I'm going to say he was neglected for months. You know, there's two ways that you can go with this. And this case took me a really long time to um, get through because I wanted to rerun my calculations. I wanted to rerun my report over and over just to make sure that I wasn't biasing it one way or the other, that I wasn't letting any personal feelings come into it, nothing. Right. Um, and since then I've put into place uh, things, you know, it's, I don't really talk about cases until they're said and done because I don't want somebody, you know, like mom, just being mom saying, oh, that's awful. You know, I don't, I, I can't hear that. I have to be as, as clinical as possible. Right. And um, I have to make sure that I don't know who the, the victim is, who the perpetrator is any, I, I want the bare minimum of information because I yeah. do not want to bias myself. So this was just a really big um, a big struggle, honestly, because it was just awful all around. Sure. And, and I, I think that these cases uh, that you're bringing up, you know, mm -hmm. when we put the warning out that, you know, yeah. this, this program has graphic imagery, oh, yeah. um, and graphic content for sure. But I think it's a really good point that we're that mm -hmm. we're showing this. And, and the reason the reason I say this is because, you know, whether whether you're a, a forensic entomologist or a police officer who's responding mm -hmm. to the scene these these scenes the this these cases are disturbing yeah and, and then you have to take care of yourself you have to Absolutely. make sure um because i would imagine that there's some possibility or risk of post-traumatic stress oh yeah for you for mm -hmm. the investigators for the police officers first responders um you know getting these images out of our minds is not easy. Is exactly. It's, it's definitely not an easy thing. And uh, self care and our mental health is really important. Who can yeah, we come home and talk to about this? Oh yeah, it's um, this is one of those things where it's really hard to talk to significant others or parents or anything. You try as much as you can, but yeah, you know, like. I'm yes. not allowed to talk at certain dinners with in-laws anymore. Cause I'm like, Oh yeah, I have this case. And then you forget that not everybody saw this, right? They right. don't it's all have the same yes. sense of humor, but we do have a lot, you know, we, you joke around about stuff 
And there's a very fine line between uh, joking to alleviate tension and then making fun of the the case itself. So you have to be very careful about being respectful to people who have died or people who are caught up in this since you don't know what's going on there. And so there's, I counsel my students a lot on this is it's great to have a sense of humor. And that's usually what I use to take care of a lot of this to alleviate that tension, but right. you make sure that you're not being a jerk about it. And you especially yeah. don't say anything where the family can he hear it or stakeholders or anybody who might be affected. And then the second somebody goes, eh, like I just stopped talking and change the subject. But yeah, I started, um, seeing a therapist years ago because of this, because when there's something of this nature, and it's in your head and this was a this was a rough case because these are the least of the photos <laughs> just, there were I some bet. really awful ones right and that's just in your head now and you've seen it yep and you and, can't oh. and you can't unsee it you know you and, I, I'm, and yeah. I'm glad you, i'm glad you brought up humor as a uh mm -hmm. coping mechanism oh, yeah. <laughs> you know we, as police officers you know i spent 20 years in the nypd mm -hmm. and uh, worked in the housing projects in brooklyn in my in the early years, you know, in the horse and buggy era, <laughs> when we had papyrus, uh, that we yeah, had back in the day, memo book, yeah, for memo books and reports, um, right, Doctor Massey, you you can identify with what I'm saying, I'm sure. Stone tablets, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. just stone tablets, right? I'm just kidding, Doctor Massey, but anyway, he's on, he's watching, but um, we would sometimes just we'd have to just goof around with each other, yep. but like you said, not in front of any oh, other, yeah. like not in front of civilians, not in front of family, for sure, not in front of family. Oh man! But, but you know, it's not that we're callous, and it's it's not that we're morbid. It's it's more that this is so unreal. Yeah, what we're seeing that we that we actually have to like. Um, I don't know. We 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 have to like do something, whether it's you use humor or yeah. uh, or callousness as a as yeah. It's a release valve. Shield. You have to protect yes. yourself somehow. Exactly. And it can be really easy to just start. Um, yeah, become so used to this that you have no feelings left. You just don't care because you yeah. have to shut them down, and that's also an awful place to be. And then this is what when we end up seeing, you know, drug abuse and alcohol abuse and those sorts of things, you're trying to dull those feelings. Exactly. And exactly. and then when you talk to somebody who doesn't do this on a regular basis, and you'll say something that, you know, can seem really awful to somebody who hasn't stared at these photos and read the the reports and done the research or whatever, looked at the evidence for a year, and you say something like flippant. Uh, and then they go, that was horrible. And then you feel bad about everything and yourself and all that. And then, yeah, the, it, you yes. can get into arguments over it. And it's, it's either you take it all in and you keep it and you harm yourself or you get rid of it somehow. Yes. And so, yeah, there are, there are cases where I will jump online with, with, uh, my therapist and just be like, okay, here's the thing. Yeah. I can't <laughs> sleep. It's yeah. it's bad right now. And yeah. all the humor in the world isn't going to fix this. Exactly. You know, the children cases are really hard or cases that hit really close to home for some reason, yes. whatever it is. And then, you know, about cases just in your neighborhood or just around you, you get called in on a case that was down the street. And you're like, cool. Yeah. I love it here. Now I'm terrified to go outside or whatever. Right. It is. Right. Exactly. All these different ways that you deal with it. And some are healthy, some are not. And it can be it can be upsetting for people who aren't in it. Yes. You know, it's, I've Absolutely. learned to read people's faces and when they just start to look slightly horrified, I just change the subject. Yeah. <laughs> well, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I just wanted to underscore like, you know, uh, what, you know, the disturbing nature of yeah. everything that we're seeing and that we're being exposed to and mm -hmm. what you yeah. Uh, as this, as the expert uh, is mm -hmm. exposed to. So I'm really glad we were able to nail, oh, yeah. nail Jump down in some of those uh, points, but go yeah. ahead. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to interrupt you now. Go ahead. We have like one more, maybe two more cases left. So uh, this case, this next case isn't gross. So that's good. I could have stopped on this one. Weird. So this particular case is um, this one. I love because it was so unusual. In this case, investigators had the car of a suspect and they wanted to know if we could tell where that car was driven based on the insects on the car. So in this case, I asked them not to tell me where they were from even since I taking cases from all over the place. 
Um, they sent the case to somebody else who then sent it to me. So I couldn't even get a clue from the, uh, the postmark or anything like that. They scraped the insects from the windshield, from the radiator, the, uh, the air filter from the left and right trim of this car. And they just asked, is there a way to tell where this person drove based on the bugs that are found on this car? And I found that a really, really interesting challenge to do. And if you've ever seen your windshield after a, a road trip or something, you know, it's not intact bugs. It's just it's thoraxes and legs and wings of things and all that sort of stuff. So I had these Petri dishes full of insect parts. And I was just going through trying to ID down to the lowest taxonomic level I possibly could. I wanted to get to species if I could, but if I couldn't, you know, it happens. And then I needed to figure out where these things are mostly found. Now, um, the italicized things that you see here, these are all of the insects that I found that I was able to ID. Some are really, really common. Some are a little bit less so. So things like cochlea my massillaria, this is a blowfly, same with Corioviridis. Uh, so they have wings, they can fly a bunch of places. This Neomaya, it's, it's kind of like a, a housefly-ish type of thing. Polina ruta, same thing. Apis mellifera, this is a, uh, a honeybee. So those can be all over the place. That's just the European honeybee. Uh, Aedes aegypti, this is a mosquito. Uh, this tends to be found in uh, sort of the Southern region, although it's been moving up North. Here's just some more flies. Then I went into some um, genera of these things, different beetles and such. And then I had to go through and find exactly where these things live. The way that we do that is I look at museum records. I look at collections. I look at surveys and throughout the literature. So I went to a bunch of different museums, looked to see where these things had been found and just started to create a, basically a heat map, a map of where... Um, these things are found on a regular basis. And then I tried to see where they would all overlap. And so what I ended up with was this, here's the evidence as it came up in these tubes. These are the most common, or these are the ones that have the uh, um, smallest regions uh, of um, area where they're normally found. And then this is the map that I came up with based on everything. Some of these species like Apis mellifera, they're found all over North America. And so that wasn't going to tell me much. Uh, others are pretty common throughout all the U.S. Still others are most common in this sort of southern region. So this presence of a few in insects here indicated that the car was likely at least originating in the southeastern U.S. Um, the beetle up here, this is the type of beetle that is found uh, almost exclusively in the southwest of the United States. It's been reported from Colorado to Kansas, Texas, and Arizona. So it was an unusual one. It, it was one of the few things that we don't normally see in the southeastern region. It's associated with things like crops. So it was very possible that this might be extending its region to the eastern U.S., but there are absolutely no published reports of it being in in the Southeast. There was nothing that I can find in any collection anywhere that it was there. Um, the, the, uh, the One of these flies is uh, Drymia species. It's associated with flowering plants and it's most commonly found from high altitudes in Colorado. So now I've got two insects that are in Colorado and not in the Southeast. Um, this blowfly here is Califera um, genarium, and it prefers cold weather. This case happened during the summer months. And so the Southeastern area, very, very hot and humid in those Southern months, this fly just doesn't really happen during that time. Uh, I've only seen it reported in any collection from Alaska through Canada, and then the higher elevation in the U.S., like Colorado. There's no reference of this species anywhere in uh, the Southern United States, especially not during the warmer months. So it's possible that you could find it in areas where it's really high altitude, but it likes the cold. So it didn't make sense. It'd be like in Florida or Texas or Louisiana. 
um uh this family up here these are some dung flies and things uh they have their greatest diversity near southern canada again there's a few species that are found in warm areas but the specimen that i found was only partial it was only a couple of legs and a thorax and i think one of those compound eyes so it uh was really hard to determine down to species so i was going with well this is another one that could be up in the northern regions um and uh, so I couldn't get an exact range, but they tend to be most common up north. And so using these, all these different insects, I uh, was able to determine that this car was in the southeastern U.S. for most of the time, probably Florida, but it may have traveled outside that range to an area that was either high altitude or cold. So I was thinking Colorado, maybe into Canada. Uh, unfortunately, this wasn't exactly what they were looking for. Uh, they were hoping I could get like down to an exact city or something, which is not something I could do given our current state of knowledge. So in this case, I could give them the, it went to a cold area. Uh, but I had no idea exactly what city that was in because there simply wasn't the evidence. And I had to rely on museum evidence. Museums, uh, especially entomology museums, it, they're kind of hit or miss. If um, you don't have the funding for this, it takes a lot of money and, and time and effort and expertise to keep a good museum. And uh, we rely a lot on individual private collectors and donations in addition to professionals going out and collecting things. So it could just be that some of these uh, insects that were on this car I could have been able to uh, narrow it down if I had perfect information, knew exactly where they were going to be. But we just don't have that. And we don't have the money to keep uh, these uh, museums up and running in every single place in the world. So I worked on a paper where you're know, sort of trying to give credence to a lot of these museums saying we need this and we need to keep it up. And here's an actual case where it would have helped. And they wanted a much finer um bit of information than i was able to give with this particular thing but it was still kind of neat to be able to say okay they ended up coming from the south southeastern region that's where this uh car was originally so i was at least able to narrow it down to that and i gave them a little bit to go on with there are these cold weather high altitude insects that you just don't find in that area so that is some pretty good evidence that they um that car was driven out of that region but i could not give them an exact you know longitude and latitude for any of this so those are uh the cases that i had set up for you and i'm happy to answer any questions or discuss anything you want i could talk about this for the rest of my life so if you give me the go ahead i'm going to talk forever so let me know what you need. All right. Stop sounds, my share. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me um let me just put a add a spotlight here and uh here's here's what I have to say about yes. <laughs> about the whole thing. Um I mean, this is so fascinating. All of this is so interesting and the uh, bugs are the best. I'm telling bugs. you. Well, I mean, this is what I have to say about. Let's see, I don't ah. know if you can see that blur here, but I got, got my props. This, yeah, I got props, but uh, I'm itchy. I'm like, I'm yeah, like, I'm like itchy all over. But listen, we have. Um, what I want to do is I want to open this up now for uh, yeah. discussion. The chat is blowing up over here, so um, there's a couple of things that uh, folks have said, and I would really love for you guys uh, who are watching on YouTube, as well as those who are present, uh, that if you have a question or a statement, please raise your hand. Uh, let me know. Let us know. Those who are actually in the webinar, uh, like, well, we have Justin and we have Layla, Abby, um, Alex, rather, uh, Morgan, Stephanie, and Ivana are, are in the webinar, but then we have tons of people on, uh, on YouTube. So Excellent. just do me a favor, guys, just if you are um, in on YouTube, just throw in the chat the questions that you have. Um, so this way I can get to everybody. Uh, I know that somebody had asked, how do you get it out of your mind? Oh, how do you how do you do that? Um, and um, also, well, yeah. go ahead. Answer that one first. Yeah. So for me, it's the humor. And it's always going to be in my mind. And I, but I figured out a long time ago that if I talk about it and I um, 
joke about it and discuss it, the more I talk about it, the less power it has. And that has worked for any trauma at all in my life. So I, I treat this as a trauma and, um, I've done a lot of training and that sort of thing in like trauma response. And I've worked at um, suicide hotlines and rape crisis centers, and they give you all this training. And that has served me better than pretty much anything because you know, okay, this is trauma. This is not the, a thing that everybody always sees. And so when I see something awful or gross, I will make a joke about it. I will tell people about it. I will talk to students about it. I've written books, you know, all these things. And every time I talk about it, a little bit of the power goes away. Uh, mm -hmm. And even then though, there's still stuff that really affects you, you know, three in the morning after a really bad case that you're not allowed to talk about, you know, all these cases are many, many years old because I've got cases that are still open or people are still alive, or I don't want to cause problems with cases that are currently going through the court system. Right. So I can't talk to anybody, not even my husband about it. And so it's, uh, um, that can be daunting. And so, uh, I highly recommend to everybody therapy, therapy is a thing and we should all be in it. And yes. they are magic because it's just an outside person who has confidentiality that you can say literally anything to, and they can give you tools to handle it in the moment. Uh, and, and then what to do if, if it affects you and the weirdest things ended up, end up affecting you. Like you'll run into stuff. You didn't even, it's not even that bad of a case, but for some reason it hit you in a place. I worked a case once where, uh, there was clothing that my husband had on the body and that hit me like there was nothing else. And like, I just couldn't handle it. So I ended up, he got new clothes and those clothes disappeared. It was, I don't know what happened to him. It's crazy. You know, things of that nature. Or uh, there was one case where the victims looked a lot like me and they were in my area. And so that freaked me out. Or, and then uh, for a long time, I was just afraid of the dark. It just showed up at weird things. Me and my little two-year-old niece are freaking out when the lights are out, you know? And so that helped when I had somebody else to talk to and tools and all that. And um, I also, you know, I, I also am a black belt in kickboxing. So I did that for a long time, simply because I was living in an area where there was a lot of cases happening. And when you realize what's going on right outside your door, ignorance is bliss. Sometimes I'm like, I can't even walk to my car. And yeah. so it was that, it was a little bit of empowerment, you know, it was just that little bit of, okay, I know how to run away. I know how to punch somebody in the nose. I know how to, whatever it is. Um, and that's an awesome stress reliever. So that is super helpful. <laughs> and, yeah. and so yeah. you end up surrounding yourself with people who understand, which is really helpful. Right. Uh, people you can talk to about it. You learn to read the room a little bit where, you know, you got Thanksgiving dinner with the in-laws and they ask how your day was and you just go, wait till dessert. We're eating meat right now. And you don't want to know. Thank you. But <laughs> right. you joke about it. And my dad um, taught me for a million years. He, he dealt with uh, his uh, stress with humor. And so I grew up learning to do that. And that's, I just make jokes like there's no tomorrow and hope I don't offend anyone. <laughs> And we can clear a restaurant if you go out with the wrong, if you go out with a bunch of nurses or something, man, you can just have a fight on who's going to tell the grossest story at the table while we're all eating. That's and true. you just look around, everybody is left and you have yeah. to leave. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yep. yeah, getting That's it out of true. your head, really impossible, but there's a lot of tools you can use. Yeah. Yeah. I was just, uh, I was just speaking um, for uh, various police departments, plantation police department, Davie police, uh, Fort Lauderdale police, Pembroke Pines police. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a group of crisis negotiators. And I was talking about 9-11 mm -hmm. uh, with them. And uh, one of the things that I shared with them was uh, being deployed to the morgue and having the medical examiner show me these 50 photos of remains um, yeah. and asking my I guess what what my guidance would be around should we show these to the families? Oh yeah. And um, you know, we're talking 20 something years later, and I I can I can conjure up those images mm -hmm. right now if I needed to, you know, like they don't go away. So yeah. one of the questions that was asked is like, does it go away? And I think we compartmentalize it. Would you yes. agree? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's it's the type of thing that you can push aside when you're in the midst of something happy. 
you know, I'm babysitting my my nieces or my nephews or whatever. And I'm not going to think about this now. You know, right, I'm not going to think right. about the case of the dead child that I just worked. You know, you, you yeah. have to put that aside. But yeah, it doesn't it doesn't go away. Um, it is also helpful when you remind yourself while you're why you're seeing it. And this is something I teach to my students a lot um, where it's, you know, you see some horrible images on a movie or something like that, and you're just sort of a passive passive observer. I'm seeing it because there might be something I can do. And that is always a touch point for me, a little touchstone of it might not be a huge part, but I might be helping somebody get closure. I might be helping put yeah. you know somebody off the street or, or help solve this. Right. Uh, but even think- if it's the tiniest little bit of something, that is just a nugget that you can hang on to, which does make it easier. Exactly. And so you, putting all those things together is really helpful. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're problem solvers, you know, yeah. whether we're experts, forensic experts, or we're investigators. And you have to kind of like remind yourself, you're almost like self-talk, like, remember why you're here. Exactly. You're it's not, okay. I know you're tired. Yeah. You're <laughs> here. You're, you're not here because you're a curiosity seeker like Joe Civilian. You know, mm-hmm. you're here because there's a reason you're here and you better start paying attention to what's going on Yes, because you're going to help solve this case or yeah. put something in the right direction. Absolutely. Okay. And you can go into the science of it, which helps take it out of that like painful area. Yes. You know, with, yes. Like um, the neglect case I can go into, these are flies that show up on fecal material. Fecal material does X, Y, and Z. It's very clinical. Yeah. Which helps take away those feelings, which is really nice. You still have to deal with them later, but in the moment. Right. And then uh, since I teach so much, so I'm the assistant director of the forensics program here at AM, um, I get to deal with students who are coming in and they're going to go off and be amazing things. Some students just come through and you're like, you're going to do some amazing stuff. And to be able to be a part of that, you just, I, t- I teach them one class and I think you know, this could be someone that goes off and cures cancer or somebody that goes off and solves the most heinous of crimes or whatever they're doing. So every case that I work, I figure out how I can use that to teach my students better. So instead of taking it as it's just something you have to deal with, you turn it into something that can do good in the long run. So every yes. single case that I should, when I do these sorts of things, it's maybe yes. there's somebody out there that this can help change or, or help them understand how something's going to be. And then that's going to be a ripple effect. Excellent. So yeah, that, that teaching part of it is huge as well. So I want to go to the YouTube chat now, and I'm going to ask for, um, if, if Justin and Layla don't mind, uh, Justin, if you come on first, you come on first and, and do me a favor, field some of these questions for Dr. Brundage. Okay. There's a start. Let's start with Dr. Massey. There's like the last, the last few we've got Dr. Massey all the way to Angela asking some outstanding questions. And I'd like to give Justin some airtime. All right. There he is. <laughs> that's our, that's our guy behind the scenes. And, and Layla is uh, with us and she'll come on in a minute too. So maybe Justin, you take the first two. How's that? Yeah, that's fine. So I know one question that was asked kind of like multiple times were mm-hmm. drugs and their effects on the bugs. Yes. I'll read one out right now. It's from Angela. It says, does drugs or toxins affect the presence of bugs on the body and will they develop at a decreased rate? Yeah. So this is an area of study called entomotoxicology. It is uh, based on the idea that insects literally are what they eat. Whatever they're eating, whatever's in a body or an animal or something are going to go into the insect. And they don't have that same deactivation system that we have as humans. So they don't have livers or, or things of that nature to break down and excrete a lot of these toxins. So if there's alcohol or heroin, cocaine, whatever in this body, that's going to get into the insect. There's been some limited research on it. Uh, and certain drugs will make uh, the maggots grow a little bit faster. Others will make them grow slower. There's 
think it's heroin that makes it where they have little tiny heads, big old butts. It's, it's very strange. Um, and so that sort of thing happens all the time. So when we do entomology cases, one of the things we have to ask is, uh, could we see the talk screen? Could, uh, is there evidence of drug use anywhere at the scene? Do we need to take that into account? And some of my students do uh, research. One of the research projects they did was, um, they worked, uh, one of the kids worked at uh, an ER and found that people were coming in ODing on, you know, alcohol, which is sort of normal, but they were also ODing on cough syrup and caffeine in this area. And so she was wondering, is that going to affect the insects? And so we uh, basically dosed some liver with alcohol and that slowed down the insect uh, growth significantly cough syrup slowed it down even further than alcohol did and the lethal dose of caffeine killed them outright and so if somebody ods on caffeine they may the insects may totally die which was fascinating to find out and then uh, i i'm lucky enough to go and be able to visit the texas body farm uh to do some training and such and we've noticed that if a body dies when they're under hospital care and they're on some hardcore antibiotics or they're on chemo, flies will not show up. So if you kill off all the bacteria on the body or a lot of it, the flies aren't gonna be attracted to it. And you could have bodies right in a row. One body is decomposing maggots all over, right next to it is a body that died on chemo and nothing, it just mummifies in the middle of summer. And so there's that interaction between bacteria, antibiotics, and the flies that is still pretty poorly understood. There's some major groups uh, doing a lot of research on it right now. And people are just figuring out that this inter interkingdom communication, as they call it, between insects and bacteria and mammals is so is way more important or way more um, obvious than we ever thought. Wow. Awesome. And I, I know Justin's got, I can, I can read his mind. I know he's <laughs> I know he's going body farm. <laughs> What's a body farm? So body farm is usually an anthropology facility. It is a, an area of land where you can take donated bodies and you just put them out. It's one of the many things that when you will your body to science or donate it to science that you do uh, that um, you can do. So the original one was, is at University of Tennessee. I think that's uh, it was Bill Bass, forensic anthropologist, started that years and years ago. But at um, Texas State, we have one and it's really big. It's five acres. And uh, they take in a lot of donated bodies and it's the anthropology facility again. And what they do is they use the natural processes to clean off the bones basically. But because they're doing that, entomologists can jump in, investigators can jump in. We do a lot of research out there. Um, I can go and I do training for investigators and students and things on how to do forensic entomology. I've been out there with arson investigators so that they can actually see how fire affects bodies. And so let me ask you this. Yeah. So can, so are you taking any interns? No. Yeah. Justin, oh yeah. You want to, yeah. you want to go take a job over there and do that? <laughs> he's no, not, he's saying no, no, he don't want to do that. This is not my field. This is not my field. <laughs> That's your field. Just Very everywhere. good. Good answer. Good answer. All right, Justin, you want to give us uh, give us another question? Are you going to just go like going to go up to Kayla? Yeah, absolutely. There is okay. a question on what is the rarest insect you've ever found on a victim? Ooh, on a victim. Ooh, most of them are pretty common. Um. Well. It's not really a rare bug, but I'd never gotten it in a case before. I got a case where they sent me a bunch of ladybugs that were around it, which was really weird. Um, and it was the ladybugs where I think either were just incidental insects showing up on the body or they were going after the fluids. But insects that you don't normally assume are going to show up on bodies like butterflies or beetles or things like that. They'll come in and drink the fluids off of a body, which is really creepy looking. And if you haven't if you don't have an entomologist there, those are usually the ones that uh, collectors will look at and be like, why are there swallowtail butterflies all over this body? And they'll send those and they can't really tell me anything. They're there on a regular basis, but um, yeah, insects are brutal in general. They don't care where their food comes from. They're just going to show up. Good. Thanks. Okay, Thank Justin, you. thanks so much. Let's get Layla on to ask a couple of other questions from some of our other viewers. Hey guys. Um, so one of the other questions on here is kind of, it says by Larry, 
When does the presence of bugs on a car become too stale to be revealing? That's yeah, it. that's something we don't know. That is a great research question. Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, that's some of the, the stuff we have to think about when um, we are doing this sort of report is I had like for that question, I had no idea when that person was driving or when they last washed their car or anything of that nature. So it's not like I can say this person definitely did this in the last week. Uh, you could probably look at how dried the hemolymph or the insect blood is, but again, I mean, that'd be an experiment you could run, probably be pretty simple to run, but I, I don't know of any papers where we've done it. Um, you, you would probably be able just to go on a road trip and see how long it took just the flies to drop off on their own. Yeah, it's a lot of these things we have to come up with research in order to answer those exact questions and just see what is going on. So the answer is, oh, do the mm, research. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> great. All right. There's a there's a good another research project for you there, Dr. Massey. Exactly. All right, Layla, let's ask uh, one or two more. OK, another one asked by I had it by Kayla. She asks, what's the most amount of bugs you've seen on a dead body? Oh, man. <laughs> these bodies can just be covered. If you think about it, I mean, humans are just big bags of nutrients. We're just carbon, nitrogen, water, minerals. Uh, when we're alive, we're just trying to keep all these things to ourselves. And then when we die, they have to go back into the nutrient cycle. And uh, I have seen bodies just completely covered. It looks like one massive mass uh, and they're just everywhere. And so um, can't even count, but... Uh, one of my research projects, I was looking at how flies show up and lay eggs on a body and they lay eggs in these big clutches and each fly female can lay about 300 eggs, which is a little clutch like this. I found a clutch that was the size of a softball and I counted those eggs because I was a grad student and that was my job and I'm a little masochistic on that, but that was 40,000 eggs and there were several softball size um, egg masses on this body. And so, you know, it's hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of maggots can be there. And the more maggots that are there, uh, the more efficient they are at feeding on a body because they have exodigestion. So they puke up their guts and then let it digest and then suck it back up. And so the most I've seen is just an entire six foot person. You, you couldn't see flesh. It was just maggots. And then they started to move away and it was crazy. <laughs> OMG. <laughs> so Layla, neat. You're, you're into this, Layla? You're getting into it? Yeah. Um, Are you thinking about it? Maybe. Come on. You know you want to do the research. <laughs> you too can count the maggots. I, listen, I'm I'm going to lend you. I'll lend you the raid. <laughs> I have it. I'll lend then it I'll have to get the whole protective gear because yeah, <laughs> just as <laughs> uh, it made you to be wearing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, great. Um <laughs> And all right, so I think that most of them have been answered. We answered, we we actually answered the drugs or toxins affecting, um, and you also answered, you know, how bacteria is uh, is affecting. So I think that's it. I mean, did you have any questions? And Justin, did you have any questions yourself? And uh, I just give Alex and uh, and the other attendees, Stephanie or <laughs> Ivana, a chance, last chance. But go ahead, Layla. Any questions? I definitely have a question because um, okay. you were talking about kind of when you were younger in preschool and how you like mm -hmm. like bugs and stuff like that. But I want to kind of get into how you wanted to like do this and look at bugs on like a dead body because that's so two completely different fields as far as looking at bugs in the natural <laughs> and then on dead bodies. I just want to know how you kind of got interested in that. So, you know, I knew about forensic entomology. Um, you know, I went to high school in the 90s. And, you know, I had, there were one or two news stories every once in a while, like I'd get a newspaper clipping from a youth leader or something like that. Um, so my youth leader at the time from church had clipped something for me and I thought that was interesting, but I went to my undergrad for plant protection sciences, actually, <laughs> which is uh, biocontrol of insects on cropland. Cause that's right. where a lot of entomologists go is we do um, pest control and um, rearing insects for biocontrol and all that. So that, that's what my undergrad was in. And uh, I went to grad school for a master's and I ended up going to San Jose State University because I followed a boy and he happened to get a job up there. So I magically <laughs> got into grad school. It was amazing how that went. It's cool. I married him, so it's fine. But, um, <laughs> you know, I just went in and my first day in grad school, 
it was pretty or really early on, um, my advisor from that school, he had gotten called in on a cold case. And so I was just happened to be in the lab and he's like, Hey, you want to check this out with me? And I went, yeah, that sounds interesting. And so I worked this cold case and, um, looked at it and I was hooked from that. It was just, this is a thing I can do. You know, and I grew up doing mysteries and, you know, back in the eighties, it was encyclopedia Brown and Nancy drew and all those, I had every single one of those memorized. I loved all those stories, everything. And so when I had a chance to actually do it, I just sort of changed my whole trajectory and mm -hmm. I created this, um, my research project on forensics. And I just sort of investigated what I could do. And at that time, the ABFE wasn't even, wasn't really around. Um, we didn't have a lot of this happening. And so I just started reading everything I could get my hands on, um, volunteering at places, taking whatever classes I thought were important. I took forever to get on my master's program because of it. It took me seven <laughs> years in a master's program, but it worked out perfectly because right. once I finished my master's, by that time, I'd started to meet people in the field. ABFE had just started. Um, I was going to the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. And one of the people I met uh, was a, um, a researcher and forensic entomologist here in Texas. And so I, I gave a talk on the research I was doing. He's like, hey, do you want to get a PhD? I'm thinking of doing that one. Yes, I do. Just uprooted <laughs> everything. And my husband followed me. And then we moved out here. And so just sort of everything fell into place um, after, after that. And I'm also very, very stubborn. And so I would do things like volunteer at the uh, morgue, uh, volunteer at a morgue, it's a thing in you your, in your, well, in you know, your spare time. Yeah. In your I, spare time when you have nothing yes. else. Well, I met the medical examiner at yeah. a conference and you know, yes. doing networking, and he's like, Hey, I'll call you if there's ever any bugs on a body. And I'm like, great, I will do it for free. And so during one summer, I would pack a lunch and take a book and I just hung out in the lobby. And I think they just felt sorry for me eventually because I was there all day every day. They're like, you don't have to be here. I'm like, no, that's cool. Yeah. I have a book. Okay. And yeah, very good. And eventually right. they, like they had a body that had eggs in the hair and they're like, we don't really need this, but you're sitting here. Can you come back? And yes, I can. And then wow. I wrote a report and I did all these things. And I just started doing that and volunteering everywhere I could. And then um, investigators would come to me and say, hey, uh, can you help us with some training on this? Like, what do you do? We'll pay you by giving you gloves. You know, you need rubber gloves. Here you go. Here's some gloves for your work. Great. You know, so it was like a barter system. Then yeah, that's pretty much how I got into it. And then you just sort cool. of make a name for yourself. Yeah. So, yeah. Great. Which you have. And yeah, uh, I hope so. Where, <laughs> yes, you have. Thank you, Layla. Um, yeah, thank I'm you. To Justin. Justin's got a, a question. Yes. So I know that you do face like a lot of challenges, especially in your cases. Yeah. And I wanted to know, like, what are the most common challenges you face and have there been any improvements like in the tools that you use to face those challenges? So good, good with question. my casework, my biggest challenge is identifying the species of insect that are there. And then closely on the heels of that is having the data that is necessary to run the analysis that I need. So the species of insect, um, we get the same ones for the most part, but every once in a while, some weird ones come up or it's a species that is an invasive species or it's something that nobody's really looked at before. So I'm just there staring at, at this maggot or something under the microscope and cursing everything in the world. Um, with that uh, abuse case with the uh, um, Drosophila, that's why it took me so long to ID it was there, there aren't any dichotomous keys that really ID it. So the way that we do this stuff is through published keys that look at physical unchanging characteristics. If nobody's written a key for it, you have to figure out a different way. And DNA can work, but it's very expensive and it isn't, we don't have the DNA sequences for everything. And so with that one, it was, I was just going from museum to museum with my specimens and looking at thousands upon thousands of insects and seeing if they look the same or not, and then trying to figure it out and going back to, you know, papers that were written in the 1800s and trying to figure out what the heck they meant when they were <laughs> saying stuff. So that was really, really challenging. But then once you have an ID, I need to know how many hours it takes these um, insects to go through the egg stage and then hatch into the first instar maggot, through the, inst through the three instars of maggot, through the pupae, through the adult. I need to know how long that takes. And that is a huge project to have to run. I mean, we're talking months and months and months of putting maggots in, at standard temperatures and watching them every two to three hours to see what they're doing. 
And so some of these forensically important flies, we have a lot of data on, and that's great. I've published papers. So when I run my um, analysis, I have papers, I can say, here it is. Others, we just don't. So there are things like, yep, this is this fly that nobody's ever researched before. So, and so if I don't have the time or the equipment to research it myself, and there are some flies that you just can't rear in colony or they're so super, super difficult. So we just haven't taken that on. You know, it's a bunch of stuff. It's a lot of money and time in order to get it done. And so if, if it happens to be one of those things, you have to just sort of do your best. But then when I write my report, I have a whole page of like, caveats. Like, here's all my assumptions and here's how it can change. And I understand that. So I, here's, here's the best. Good luck. And sometimes you turn in a report. They're like, we can't do anything with this. You're like, yeah, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like the report with the car and scraping stuff off. I'm like, here you go. That's what mm. I can, that's what I can show you. Um, well, sorry. Listen, it, it, this, this is, uh, this is so fascinating. Yep. And we could, we can go on and on and the Forever. dean is texting me and the dean is telling me how, <laughs> she's so, she's so um, impressed with you awesome. and um, really wishing that you can come back yeah. uh, another time. Yeah. And, and if anybody so, ever has any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, my website excellent. is forensicentomologist.com. Okay. I've got email. I've got everything. And I am happy to talk to anybody about anything. I teach every class ever. So I teach at a lot of different universities. So you might have me in class one day. That'd be amazing. Oh, that'd be awesome. Well, uh, can, can, we get a, can we get your commitment to come back? Uh, as I would guest? love to. Whenever okay. you want me, I will be here. As long Fabulous. as apparently the entire city is in underwater. In which case, I'll drive elsewhere and it'll happen. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. Well, um, we really appreciate your time because- Thank you so much for having me. This was great. We know that, uh, you know, you have a very, very busy, tight schedule and uh, that you said yes to us. We're grateful. And um, just so thank you. This was really powerful. Anything for you. Thank you. Powerful, <laughs> powerful program. Uh, everyone is like, can't stop <laughs> saying how impressed they are, you know, Good. with the content and with you. So thank you again. Thank uh, you so much for having me. This was so much fun. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank our viewers, everybody for watching. I want to thank Alpha Phi Sigma and I apologize again to them for the link problem, <laughs> but um, they can watch this on the, uh, as I say, the rerun. Yeah. And <laughs> Uh, and also I want to say thank you to the deans, you know, to Dr. Durham and Dr. Castro, Dr. Kushner, uh, for the support that they give to the School of Criminal Justice and for our programming. And uh, don't forget, don't forget all my students, you've got to email me that you are here tonight. I know that you put your names in, but doing the best I can. With get trying that to credit. Them, but get that extra credit. It always helps. You never know. All right. So thank you guys again for being here tonight. Uh, we really, really appreciate you. Thank and, you so uh, much. Be safe and get a can of Raid. <laughs> no. Hug the All right, don't get a can of Raid. <laughs> okay. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>